Hello everyone, welcome back. This is the last lecture of this uh, course and in this uh, lecture, I am going to introduce you to stochastic FEM. Finite element analysis is a popular uh, structural analysis tool that uh, can be used uh, very comfortably for different type of structures with different boundary conditions, material properties, loading conditions. Now, when we model a structure, definitely we use certain parameters. For example, if we model a beam, then it's the cross section, then Young's modulus, then uh, support conditions. These are the informations that we provide uh, while we formulate the finite elements. And then uh, once we uh, form the elemental matrix, then we assemble that uh, small elements and we construct the complete structure and then uh, we solve for the response of the structure. That is how the uh, finite element works. Obviously, uh, we start from a set of differential equations which may be boundary value problem and sometimes also initial value problem. And then uh, through certain mathematical operations, we actually convert them into a system of linear equations. And in this framework, uh, all the variables that we deal with, they are deterministic in nature. So, uh, if we talk about uh, structural analysis using finite element, obviously, uh, in reality, there can be two options. Either the variables are deterministic, but very often we also face random variables uh, and their stochasticity we cannot avoid. So, if we see the finite element framework, we can actually view the same problem from two different angles. Obviously, the first one, what we have traditionally learned is the deterministic framework. And in this framework, if you recall, if we consider a static problem, then we have this equation KU equal to F, where K is the stiffness matrix, U is the displacement field, and the F on the right hand side is the force vector that we apply on the structure. Now, being an elastic structure, the moment we apply a force, it shows some kind of deformation and that is reflected in this vector. Obviously, uh, this is uh, true at the element level, also at the global level. So, we start from the element level. So, we construct the element stiffness matrix. For that, we have certain procedures. We are not going into the details of that because uh, our aim in this lecture is to introduce you to the stochastic FEM, why we need this and uh, what are the basic steps. So, we start with the elemental stiffness matrix and then what we do, we assemble following some sequence and then we construct this global stiffness matrix. And once we do that, it becomes a set of algebraic equations. Then the moment we try to solve this u, obviously we can take the k inverse and then multiply that with f uh, and we will get the solution for u. Obviously, uh, the moment we have a large dimension of k, uh, inversion of the matrices is not so convenient. And for that again, we have certain rules to follow. Uh, to solve this set of linear equations, ultimately to get the response of the structure. Now, the moment we uh, face uh, random variables, the problem uh, is more complex. For example, uh, the moment we try to construct this element stiffness matrix, we have different variables involved in it. Uh, one of the variable, for example, let us take the Young's modulus of the material. Now, this Young's modulus of the material can be deterministic. At the same time, it can be stochastic also. Let us consider this uh, cantilever beam. So, in this case, we have a cantilever beam of certain dimensions and it is having a point load at the free end. Now, uh, when you model in deterministic framework, we have uh, the Young's modulus of the material and then also the sectional properties and then because this is a beam structure, so we can define a 2D beam element and for that we already know uh, uh, the elements of the uh, matrices and then uh, we can assemble those elemental matrices to form this uh, global stiffness matrix. Now for that, this Young's modulus, because it is a deterministic variable, it remains constant throughout the length. But we can imagine a situation where this uh, Young's modulus is randomly changing as we uh, move along the length of the beam. So, here you can see the schematic diagram. So, it has 
a mean level so that is the mean young's modulus and on top of that it has a fluctuating component as we progress along the length of the beam and at every time point we have a certain value of this uh, e and which itself is a random variable now what happens we can still model in this deterministic framework so if we define a very small element and at that element we define that as a random variable and then at the element level we can still find out the element stiffness matrix and uh, we can assemble them that is of course one way to solve the problem but uh, the problem uh, becomes more complex when uh, we have uh, some special co correlation between the random variables um, that is shown in this schematic diagram. So the stochastic representation for these type of problems can be of two different type. The first one is again of course non-intrusive. In that case what we do? We can actually uh, model this displacement field represented by u in terms of say uh, polynomial chaos expansion as we did in case of sequential uh, response surface or stochastic response surface measure method. So there what we do, did uh, is that uh, we uh, solve for uh, the outcome of uh, a set of random variables and then uh, we uh, model the response in terms of a response surface and there we use orthogonal polynomials and that's how we solve the problem. That is one way to solve the stochastic problem. But what happens in those cases actually the random field when we start modeling it and also in case of uh, structures where we have large uh, number of finite element mapping this using a non-intrusive formulation uh, becomes difficult. Particularly for uh, a case where we have a random field. For example, if we consider the Young's modulus of say a plate structure in two dimension and there is a covariance structure as you can see represented by this surface. Now for this type of problem obviously uh, using a PC based uh, response surface is difficult. Now this covariance can be described continuously or sometimes it is also defined at some discrete points. Now for this type of problem, uh, we have an intrusive formulation and that comes uh, in uh, this uh, stochastic FEM. So the formulation has again different options, altogether there are uh, four different options uh, available. So the first one obviously is the perturbation technique, then Newman expansion method, then comes weighted integral method and then finally uh, a spectral stochastic FEM method. Now in this introductory uh, lecture, we are going to uh, see how this spectral stochastic FEM uh, formulation is done and for that uh, you can refer to books. It was first introduced by uh, Ghanem and Spanos in their book Stochastic Finite Limit, A Spectral Approach and also we will refer uh, the second book, uh, The Reliability Based Structural Design. So the formulations that I will show you here. Uh, what we'll do, we'll construct the same equations you can see for the deterministic case and uh, through that equation we'll introduce u to the world of uh, SFEM. You can refer these books for further details on this topic. Now in the spectral stochastic FEM, we uh, use two major techniques. One is of course the PC based representation. So first we will quickly go through this PC based representation what we have already discussed uh, in detail we derived actually the orthogonal polynomials how they are derived that we have discussed uh, thoroughly step by step uh, but for the timing let us quickly go through because uh, in this uh, SFEM we need this uh, PC based representations at the end I will explain why we need and what help we get out of this orthogonal representation. The moment we construct the complete uh, problem and then you will uh, immediately come to know what is the advantage of this orthogonal polynomials. Now for the time being, if we have a, a Gaussian uh, say random response u theta that we can uh, represent in terms of PC. Now uh, it is a convergence series in mean square sense. So we have 
uh, this generic representation of the uh, random response u theta where we have orthogonal polynomials. Now, on the right hand side, if you see this uh, orthogonal polynomials are represented by this notation where we have epsilon i of theta is a set of Gaussian random variables. Now, uh, this subscript here, it actually indicates the order of the uh, orthogonal polynomial. Now, in this discussion, we will not use any other orthogonal polynomials, but we will solely focus on Hermite polynomial. Now, the reason why we select her Hermite polynomial already it is discussed because this uh, epsilon i, it is the Gaussian random variable. That's the advantage we get when we use uh, Hermite polynomials. All these orthogonal polynomials are actually generated by using a seed and then a weight function, if you recall. And if we change the weight function, obviously we get different uh, set of orthogonal polynomials. And for that also we need to define the domain. Now for Hermite polynomial, the domain is obviously minus infinity to plus infinity. And uh, if we change the weight function, we can generate other polynomials also, but because of the uh, advantage of uh, this uh, Gaussian random variables involved in this uh, orthogonal polynomials, we will see we will have um, certain uh, benefits. Now this uh, Hermite polynomial can be expressed in this generic expression. So the order of the polynomial is P and then on the right hand side you have this expression. In this case again uh, this epsilon it is a vector uh, and it has n entries. And uh, then uh, you can express this u of theta, that is the random response. We are trying to uh, model it using PC in this compact form. Now, in this compact form, what you can notice is that bi is the unknown coefficient. And our main task, in fact, is to identify this bi because otherwise uh, the left hand side we can uh, get from some uh, measurement or some analysis for given theta, we can actually find out what is u. Uh, if you recall uh, response surface technique, then uh, we used support points and at those support points, we used to evaluate the limit state function, which used to give this left hand side. Now on the right hand side, this psi of i, this is known because it comes from the Hermite polynomial. And then uh, the only unknown here is again b. Now, if we can generate a number of equations which is exactly equal to the number of unknowns, then we can uh, solve this or otherwise normally what we do, we have large number of uh, support points and for that we actually uh, get more number of equations developed and in that case we use a least square approach to find out this bi. Now again in that least square approach, if you recall, uh, because of the orthogonal polynomials involved in, uh, in this uh, representation, uh, we have only the diagonal elements and uh, because of the orthogonality and that's the reason uh, we have advantage while we solve this unknown coefficient. So for the time being, what we have is that the Gaussian response, we can actually represent that in terms of this polynomial representation. Okay, so if we go to a two-dimensional representation, obviously that same uh, polynomial will have this form and uh, again the same thing you can also uh, represent the, in the same format what we have discussed earlier that summation of bi times psi of i. Now again we start from the x domain where the original random variable is defined and in that domain we have mean and covariance of the variable also defined. The moment we define these two parameters, then we can actually transform this x into xi. And that's precisely what we do using this transformation. And that's how we convert, we used to convert gx equal to 0 to gz equal to 0. If you recall the reliability analysis that we have uh, gone through. Now, what is the structure of psi? For 1D Hermite polynomial, you can see uh, this is the representation of psi and then, <coughs> excuse me, small psi n is the nth derivative of the normal density function. So the normal density function you can see here, it is uh, having zero mean and unit standard deviation. And uh, if we differentiate n times, because this is a very uh, simple function to differentiate, 
and if we do that we can easily generate all this 1d hermite polynomial and that's how we can easily develop this shy functions and in fact even if we extend it for uh, multiple uh, uh, dimensions then also using this representation although it looks uh, a little complex but if you follow the uh, same notation you can easily uh, differentiate this function and then uh, we can develop uh, the polynomials of uh, given order and uh, number of dimensions. Okay, so now coming back to the set of shy we have for 1D this is the case and for 2D again this is the representation. And shy uh, 0 is always 1 and expected value of uh, epsilon to the power 0 is 1 and epsilon to the power k is uh, 0 for all k to be odd. Otherwise, uh, again, uh, if we consider this psi i and psi j, uh, which is the orthogonal representation, uh, if we take the expectation, obviously, uh, because of the orthogonality, it will uh, give you this uh, uh, finite value when i equal to j for all i non equal to not equal to j, uh, this will be 0. And this delta ij is the Kronecker delta, it equals to 1 when i equal to j and is 0 when i not equal to j. Now, in this formulation, when we uh, find out phi, sorry, uh, when you find out uh, b, uh, we can use this expression and here actually we use the uh, orthogonal property, otherwise uh, we have to go for a matrix inversion and that is the advantage of this orthogonal representation because that is how uh, we simplify while we solve this b i. Now, let us move forward. So, we use this uh, stochastic ex expansion in the non-intrusive formulation and that is how we create the surrogate model. If you recall, this is the surrogate model that we used to um, solve for generating the uh, response surface through regression. And then uh, if we have large number of support points, obviously uh, we have to go for uh, least square solution. And uh, we also discuss different other types of orthogonal polynomials, although for the time being we will not go into the details, we will only use Hermite polynomial. Nevertheless, if we have more number of support points, obviously we can go for least square solution and using this uh, uh, matrix representation we can actually solve and the least square solution also we derived earlier and the unknown coefficients can be obtained from this expression. Now here on the right hand side you have x and y, y is the observation and x comes from the um, polynomial expansion that we use uh, when we uh, replicate this y of x. So, this x is n cos cross p matrix and uh, y uh, is n cross 1, it is a vector and that is how we solve this least square solution for the unknown coefficient. So, we have the polynomial representation of the function and for that again uh, we can uh, identify this discrete y and uh, that we uh, model using the orthogonal polynomial representation. Obviously, the moment we do that, particularly in case of say regression, then uh, we will have some modeling error and you can also quantify this modeling error. And in fact, we further discussed, uh, if you recall R square value and R adjusted R square value, how to derive that and how we can decide whether we have a, a, a better model using those uh, parameters that we have gone through in detail. Now, for this uh, PC based representation, again uh, we have a model with some error and in that model what we do, we actually have um, a set of epsilon i which are basically Gaussian random variables and for that we can also find out the confidence interval uh, uh, for this representation. In that case, uh, the confidence interval will be represented by this expression. Now, uh, we also earlier discussed the how to derive at confidence intervals. Uh, again, we are not going into the details of that, but 
uh, if we have a random uh, response say u of theta then that we can uh, model using Hermite polynomials. Now of course uh, uh, we have uh, different uh, random variables that very often we encounter when we uh, solve the reliability based problem and all those random variables can be transformed and here some of the examples are given and their um, transformation when we convert them in terms of uh, standard normal variable. So this helps actually to convert from one domain to another domain through this uh, standard normal variable and for that we have this a b lambda these are actually the parameters of the distribution and using those uh, parameters we can uh, transform these random variables and then uh, we can have a pc based representation now coming back to this hermite polynomial again um, they satisfy the differential equations this is the differential equation and uh, depending upon the weight function we use we can get two different uh, set of uh, differential equations they are more or less same it only depends on the weight function in one case we have the weight function as exponential of minus x square by 2 sometimes we can also use the expansion uh, weight function as exponential of minus x square so if we use uh, this two different weight function we will get the uh, hermite polynomial but the polynomial uh, values the coefficient of those polynomials will change and the governing differential equation also will change Nevertheless, uh, both of them are second order uh, differential equations and uh, either one of them we can use. So, if we use exponential of minus x square by 2, then we get this is the set of uh, seed and the first polynomial and then we use this recurrence rel relation to generate the Hermite polynomial when n is greater than 2. Similarly, for the other weight function also, we can repeat the same procedure and for that uh, this uh, recurrence relation slightly will change, but uh, the orthogonality will be maintained and here you can see uh, first uh, seven orthogonal polynomials. We start with this seed, so these are the uh, six set of orthogonal polynomials using weight function exponential of minus x square by 2, but if we change that weight function again, the coefficient of this polynomial will change but the power of this uh, polynomial equations will remain same if you look at say h5 uh, we have x to the power 5 minus 10x cube plus 15x here only the coefficient changes because of the difference in the weight function but both of them uh, maintains orthogonality and if you uh, recall uh, the way the orthogonality is defined actually it is defined in terms of the weight function so if we uh, consider the weight functions and then say h n x and h m x then if we integrate it over the complete domain uh, we basically get uh, these orthogonal relations on the right hand side again we have a Kronecker delta which is 1 when n equal to m or otherwise it is 0. So using this now uh, we can uh, represent a function again uh, here is the function f x and that uh, can be represented using this uh, gram charlier's series and uh, this fx it denotes the probability density function and on the right hand side what we have is the small chi nx which is the nth derivative of the standard normal density now obviously if we have any probability density function on the left hand side that we can represent in this uh, format and then our only task is to find out these unknown coefficients that we can very easily do using the property of orthogonality that you can see here. So on the right hand side again uh, we have uh, this property and because of that uh, the right hand side is orthogonal and uh, if we represent this f of x which is a uh, pdf uh, generic pdf and then uh, the only unknown in this equation is this bm and that we can easily solve using this expression so the moment we define this f of x then hermite polynomials are known and then using this uh, representation we can immediately find out what is the bn 
and the moment we do that uh, we can represent fx using this relation so just by comparing say the cdf of the two representation then we can uh, quantify how many uh, coefficients or how many terms on the right hand side we need to represent this uh, arbitrary probability density function so that's how uh, the pdf is represented in terms of hermite polynomials now if we plot the hermite polynomials again earlier also we studied this this is the nature of the hermite polynomial uh, remember uh, if we change the weight function then slightly the uh, values of these functions will change because of the coefficients nevertheless uh, whichever weight function you use ultimately you will get a similar variation and these are the orthogonal polynomials and using that any arbitrary pdf can be replaced so once we represent a uh, pdf in terms of uh, orthogonal polynomials our next task uh, uh, in this introductory lecture series is to represent a, um, a random field and for that random field representation if you recall uh, if you have a random field like this then uh, it has a uh, covariant structure uh, so this is in two dimensions so if you have x1 and x2 that's the covariant structure now um, for this representation we have to introduce a special transformation it is called uh, karhun and loop transformation or kl transformation popularly now in this uh, transformation what we do uh, we can represent uh, this function uh, in terms of some uh, orthogonal uh, basis so this phi i x this is the orthogonal basis and if you look at the representation here uh, is the uh, representation of f x in terms of the orthogonal basis so again um, this uh, phi i function uh, has orthogonality but in this case uh, the coefficient b i uh, we have to find out and uh, effectively uh, this bi can be obtained uh, from this relation because of the orthogonality we have in phi so uh, once we represent this uh, what we have is actually the function fx its projection over this uh, phi ix is uh, represented by this uh, mathematical form and uh, uh, once we represent uh, in this format um, the condition for uh, uncorrelated coefficient yields actually this relation and here uh, this operator it indicates expected value operation so uh, and then delta ij is the chronic delta and mean mu is the mu is the mean of the coefficient uh, that we are going to determine now uh, using this uh, we can uh, formulate this eigenvalue analysis and the expression for that you can see on your screen and then here in this uh, this kxy function that is actually uh, uh, the function that will be represented in terms of this uh, kl transformations now again uh, this uh, phi x and lambda they denote the eigen function and eigen value and uh, using that similar expression what you have uh, done earlier again we can represent kxy in this format and uh, as we progress then uh, the series representation in terms of that eigen values here you can see this is the kl transformation now in this format again this epsilon i is a set of uncorrelated random variables and then uh, once we do that in matrix format we can actually represent this eigen value in this uh, notation and here uh, this covariance matrix whatever we want to uh, represent using this scale transformation it's a symmetric and uh, non negative definite matrix and then uh, in this representation p and uh, this lambda are the orthogonal eigen vector matrix and then eigen value matrix now using this uh, we can represent capital k in this way and effectively the transformation matrix a here you can see this transformation matrix will be p lambda to the power half then uh, once we have this transformation matrix then we can uh, get the correlated random vector say a vector t in this format so using this transformation we can actually uh, uncorrelate so 
this x which is a n cross 1 uh, uh, vector, this is a uncorrelated random variables xj. And obviously, this uh, t after this uh, transformation we get and uh, it actually possesses the co covariance uh, of the uh, original uh, definition that is k. Now, uh, we will see in a minute how we can actually uh, use this transformation to represent the uh, covariance structure. Recall uh, the example of a beam where we have the Young's modulus of the beam uh, is actually a random field and for that uh, we will see how we can actually uh, use this orthogonal transformation. Now, suppose if we have a set of observations. So, uh, these observations, uh, they have zero mean and a specific covariance structure. Then, uh, we can introduce this orthogonal decomposition and using that, we can, uh, uh, I mean, represent y uh, in terms of this pz vector where pz is the uh, orthogonal um, uh, vector. Now, uh, let us uh, take some example. So, if you have a covariance uh, structure like this represented by this uh, exponential format, then uh, it has a covariance C0 and the correlation length is 1 by h and we have actually uh, the locations in x and y, it is defined by uh, this relation. And then uh, we can uh, introduce this uh, orthogonal transformation as you can see here in this line. So, we can uh, express uh, this uh, covariance structure in this format and then we can differentiate this expression. So, we will get the first line here. Uh, so, first initially we have integration minus a to plus a that is the domain of uh, this x1 and x2 and then uh, if we differentiate that, we will get this expression and then finally, uh, we differentiate second time. So, we will ultimately get this expression. Now, if we combine these two equation, then ultimately we will get a differential equation uh, uh, of second order. And obviously, in this case, omega square uh, is uh, the uh, coefficient and that omega is uh, given here. So, now uh, it only depends upon that uh, correlation length and obviously the lambda and c naught. So, we can evaluate this omega. So, I, we can now, solve this differential equation and that is done here. So, we start with a trial solution for phi t because this phi t will be the um, orthogonal uh, basis vector. So, we have this uh, representation of phi t as a trial solution and then if we put it back, we get basically the condition that we have to solve. Now, uh, once we get this, we can solve uh, and then find out uh, the phi uh, as a resulting eigenfunction. Obviously, it will have uh, a different solution depending upon i being odd or even, then we have these two options and we can also find out lambda i that is the um, eigenvalues. So, this is the expression of lambda and then once we do that, uh, this omega i, uh, this is, uh, it, it comes from the solution of the uh, transcendental equation you can see here, either we can solve it graphically or numerically. So, ultimately what it shows that the, the periodic sines and cosines, uh, their periods are uh, represented by this uh, i minus 1 times pi by 2. So, if you put it back, we will get basically this phi i. So, that gives the solution of phi and then once we do that, then we can represent that uh, uh, random field in terms of this um, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So, that completes the KL transformation and with that, we can represent a correlated uh, random field using uh, this transformation. Out of that, the first part is actually the mean component and uh, this part, second part, it is the fluctuating component. And theta uh, uh, represents an outcome in space. Uh, and uh, we have this uh, x variable that defines actually the uh, correlation structure. Now, uh, if we just uh, correlate this with our finite element modeling, so in case of finite element, uh, let us consider Young's modulus 
as a Gaussian random field and then that can be also represented in this format what you can see here and this D0 uh, it is basically the constant matrix which is similar to deterministic FE. Now obviously if we use this format then ultimately it will be reflected in the stiffness matrix and the stiffness matrix at the element level you can see here. Now this stiffness matrix again if you look at it has similar structure the first component is basically the deterministic component that is the main part and then the second component it has this epsilon i recall this is the standard normal variable and this is the fluctuating part. Now uh, if we see the structure of this ki obviously it will also follow that same traditional bit transpose db matrix so here you go ki at the element level that is the uh, fluctuating part is square root of lambda i integrated over the complete domain phi x that is the uh, orthogonal vector times b transpose d0 b uh, at the element level uh, integrated over this complete domain. So then what we get is the structure of element stiffness matrix which has the deterministic component and the stochastic component. And KL transformation makes it easier to represent this in this format where Ki we can easily now evaluate because we know all other components. We know this D0 it comes from the deterministic analysis and this B matrix this is the traditionally called strain displacement matrix. So this B matrix uh, comes from the shape function and uh, geometric condition of the finite element. So we can easily uh, evaluate this integral and then uh, once we know the correlation structure we can evaluate this lambda. And then with the help of these two, we can define what is the fluctuating component at the element level. And the moment we know that, we can add it up with the mean component coming from the deterministic part. And that gives us the complete representation of the stiffness matrix when we have a um, random field. So here uh, we consider Young's modulus to be the random field but if you uh, consider any other material property also as the random field that will be again uh, integrated in this format. So the basic structure will remain same and uh, we can use KL transformation to actually uh, model that and uh, evaluate the fluctuating component. So ultimately once we have this uh, element stiffness matrix then uh, we can integrate with with the uh, traditional form of finite limit equation if you recall k times u is equal to f so that is what it is. So in this case this uh, k is having the deterministic component plus the fluctuating component times the displacement field gives the force vector. So uh, out of that we can take this k0 uh, from this third bracketed term so further we can modify this expression and then uh, if we do that uh, multiply both side uh, by k0 inverse so if we pre multiply by k0 inverse this side also k0 inverse will come so k0 inverse times f is nothing but the deterministic solution so that is the u0 so then what we get is this expression and then ultimately what we have is u theta that is the solution uh, for this uh, stochastic representation. So u theta will be this third bracketed term inverse of that times the um, deterministic solution u0. So u0 we can straight away find out from the uh, deterministic k0 times f. So, so k0 inverse times f is the u0 and that if we bring it here we can estimate u theta. So what we can see from this uh, discussion is that uh, this scale representation makes uh, the formulation simple because uh, using that orthogonal projection we can actually formulate the correlated random field. So that completes the basic formulation. So if we continue, uh, so we can now estimate the mean value of the response. So if we take the expectation operator on both sides then obviously uh, on the left hand side uh, we have this mean value of u that is the displacement field and on the right hand side if you recall we have a summation here. So if we apply the expectation operator that will come inside the summation operator and it will uh, act over this third bracketed term. Of course again this u is also deterministic we can take it out. 
Now, once we do that, uh, we can evaluate this uh, mean value of the response. And similarly, also we can uh, evaluate the covariance of the response and you can see the structure. Um, so, ultimately, uh, uh, if we carry out this uh, matrix inversion and this uh, uh, linear algebra inside this expectation operator, so we can evaluate the covariance. So, with that, uh, if we have a finite element model where, uh, say, material property is actually a correlated random field, then uh, for that, uh, the first two moments of the response uh, we have quantified. And uh, using mean and covariance, then we can actually uh, execute the reliability analysis for this structure. So, uh, that is how uh, you see this uh, solution is uh, done when we have a correlated random field. Now, uh, let us uh, move one step further. So, uh, this u of theta, we can now represent in terms of PCE. If you recall, we have already discussed this. So, this u theta uh, is a um, summation of this uh, PCEs and there also we will have uh, this unknown coefficients. Now, if you put it back in the uh, original expression of uh, this finite element equation, so we get this expression and then further uh, we can simplify and then ultimately we will get this expression and then from here also we can uh, evaluate uh, this expected value of u theta which is equal to now b naught that is the unknown coefficient and then uh, uh, covariance uh, of u uh, will come in this format. So, this is how we actually combine KL transformation and PCE to uh, obtain the complete solution. So, uh, that actually uh, gives you the complete view of the uh, spectral stochastic FEM. Now, let us consider a quick and simple example. So, we have uh, uh, say a X and that we represent in terms of this PC which is having 4 uh, coefficient, then we can actually find out these coefficients uh, using first four central moments. So, using that, uh, if you do this exercise, you will get the first four central moment. So, what we do on the left hand side for x, we can quantify the moments and then on the right hand side using this expression, we can evaluate the moment and then we balance them and ultimately we get the expression. Now, if we know the moments, Earlier it was in terms of if you see m1, m2, uh, m3 and m4, they are in terms of these unknown coefficients on the right hand side. So, now if we use uh, the data analysis and we can estimate the first four moments and that is given here, then in that case what we do, we actually can um, equate these uh, moments with the expression that we get uh, from PC based representation. So, ultimately it will not be a, if you look at the previous equation, this is a not a linear equation. So, we cannot uh, uh, solve it through matrix inversion. So, in that case what we have to do again, we have to find out the error between these two representation. So, the first part comes from the data analysis. So, obviously we will consider that as the benchmark and then we uh, represent the moment in terms of this unknown coefficients when we apply PC, obviously the error between these two is the error, uh, sorry the difference between these two is the error and then we square it up and sum it up, so that is the total error and we have to minimize this error with respect to CI that is the coefficients and if we differentiate this epsilon with respect to CI and equate it to 0, that gives us the conditions uh, for optimal CI. Now, obviously, in this case, because we cannot solve uh, uh, using matrix inversion, in that case, what we have to do, we have to find out the optimal solution because we have to minimize this function uh, with respect to CI. And that if we do, uh, we can easily do it in MATLAB and then we can find out the uh, first four coefficients. So, these coefficients are here and once we do that, uh, we can still represent x uh, using this uh, epsilon i. So, that is the expression now we have and based on this model also we can quantify the mm. moments and if you compare this moment with the one uh, we get from the data analysis, obviously you can see there is a small difference but uh, if we take the say first decimal term, so it will be uh, 
1 so automatically this matches with the estimated data and then similarly uh, also say the second moment we get it say 1.47 so if we consider up to first decimal term so it will match so there is a small amount of error uh, which is obvious because uh, we truncate the series which is ideally speaking this is an infinite series so we truncate after certain terms and obviously due to that reason we have certain amount of error so uh, if we continue with uh, another example uh, if we wish to find out first few terms first few coefficients using grand charlier series for hermite polynomial so if you recall this uh, this is the expression that we earlier uh, i mean went through so these are the hermite polynomials uh, that is hn here and if you have some effects then in terms of that uh, we can find out this bn so if we do that then ultimately uh, you get the expression for b0 b1 b2 b3 b4 b5 and b6 here and then uh, obviously we can further simplify this expression if we use the definition of moment and then ultimately in terms of moments also you can represent this b0 b1 b2 b3 uh, similarly you can extend uh, the exercise for um, higher uh, coefficients so b4 b5 b6 you can uh, find out yourself uh, so we can represent uh, in terms of uh, moments so effectively if we find out the moments we can uh, find out this pn so another example so if you have a covariance matrix so this example is taken from the book so if you have a covariance matrix uh, then we can actually represent that in terms of uh, orthogonal basis. So, if we do an eigen analysis, effectively we will get the eigen values and eigen vectors. So, uh, that is a, a straightforward uh, solution. So, if you have this complete matrix, uh, in fact, uh, during first order reliability analysis also, we used uh, covariance matrix and uh, that time also uh, we did the eigen analysis. Similar eigen analysis will give you the eigen values and eigen vectors and then using that information you can actually find out the transformation matrix now once you have the transformation matrix then uh, you can um, simulate uh, this uh, samples of this uh, covariance matrix and then uh, you can compare so here you can see as we increase the number of samples uh, the error decreases so that's how if we have a correlated uh, field then we can uh, first uncorrelate them in terms of this or, uh, orthogonal vectors and using that we can uh, then simulate um, standard normal variable and using that we can simulate this um, random field. So, with that our introduction to uh, stochastic FM uh, ends here. Uh, you can further uh, go through the uh, books and other research papers. Um, and then you can further develop this subject and once you have a correlated random field and uh, if you can model that in this uh, SFM framework then you can continue for reliability analysis. So, uh, that I uh, leave as an exercise for you. So, those uh, students who want to take this as a uh, further uh, topic for their research and, and for the study they can continue to do so. Thank you very much.